Please welcome Suniva Rusa. Ever since I first saw that terrifying and amazing pictures of an atomic bomb exploding, I have been extremely fascinated about nuclear physics and the power that lays deep behind the nucleus. That was how I started my master's thesis in nuclear physics. And I think that it pretty much sums it up. Terrifying and amazing. And I must admit, when I first started to learn about nuclear power, I was a bit frightened because I had learned that nuclear power, that was almost evil. This is Trinity. This is the first ever man-made atomic bomb explosion. This picture is taken one hundredth of a second after the detonation. And this fireball that you see here is 200 meters wide. These little black dots inside my pink circles are trees. So this is what can happen when you unleash the nuclear power. It's powerful and it's brutal. So, our civil nuclear power started as a military project during World War II. And today I think that many people, they still see nuclear power and nuclear weapons as almost exactly the same thing. I think that conception is wrong and often based on a lack of knowledge. So, after the war, a lot of countries, they still chose to go for that nuclear option, and they were quite happy and uh, optimistic about this until 1986, the Chernobyl accident. The world's most, or history's most ironic accident, it was a safety test. And then it took 20, 25 years before people were starting again to accept nuclear power, and uh, before 2011, it was actually a lot of fun to be in the field of nuclear power because even here in Norway we were starting to talk about the nuclear renaissance. Then, in March 2011, this happened. Japan was stricken by a devastating natural disaster. An earthquake on a magnitude of 9 on the Richter scale triggering an enormous tsunami. That earthquake and that tsunami damaged the Fukushima nuclear power plant on the east coast of Japan. However, I think that many of you here, your view on this accident is wrong. Because if you think it's like something like it was presented in the media, both Norwegian and international, which is something like, oh my god, nuclear atoms, radiation, meltdown, help, mutation, die. Well, you're wrong, you're definitely wrong. 15,000 people died or went missing, but it wasn't because of what happened at the Fukushima nuclear power plant. They died because of the earthquake and the tsunami. If, on the other hand, you think it was no problem whatsoever, you're also wrong. But actually, I think that if you have the latter view, it's actually a little bit closer to the truth than the former. Anyway, a reality check is nice. Radiation is natural. I am radioactive, you are all radioactive. Our environment is radioactive. And the dose level in Norway is actually higher than the world average, and for example, higher than it was in Tokyo, even during the Fukushima accident. It was higher in Oslo at all times. And this is mainly because of the radioactive gas radon. And just for the record, it's not dangerous to live in Norway. <laughs> so, as I said, before this, we were talking about the nuclear renaissance. And unfortunately, after this accident, it has been more difficult to talk positively about nuclear power. Because we all know this graph, or, well, maybe you haven't seen it in pink and green, but this is... Uh, um, you know, you've seen this trend before. This is the world population. It has grown from less than a billion at the time of the Industrial Revol Revolution to more than, well, or more than seven billions today, seven billions two years ago. And we know this, and I don't think we really understand, because these numbers are so huge, 
it's, it's difficult to comprehend. So if you take it down a little bit, the world population grows by 10,000 every hour. By the time that I have finished this talk, 4,200 babies have been born, and we will be in total 3,000 more people in the world every 18 minutes. And these are numbers, at least I can comprehend, I think you can too, because you can imagine 3,000 people gathering up in 18 minutes. So these people, more than 7 billion in total in the world, we need energy, we want energy, we want cheap energy, because it's so important for our society. Or of course we could say that, no, but, but those people are not entitled to our standard of living. That's not right, is it? So, that's why we get back to my field, nuclear energy. Well, before I talk about nuclear energy, I, well, I'm showing you this very nice picture here. This is a pile of hydrocarbons in the form of coal. And um, also on that picture is the equivalent amount of energy in uranium. No, you cannot see it, but it's there, I promise. <coughs> okay, so I will now try to explain a li little bit more in detail, so then I have to do this. Because if you take an atomic nucleus, like uranium-235, you bombard it with neutrons, it will fission, and when it fission splits into two, you get, you get two fission products, you get a couple of free neutrons, some gamma rays, and you get energy. And you get a lot of energy. Actually, per reaction, if you look at per atomic nucleus that fissions, and compare that to per reaction of burning coal, for example, you get 50 million times more energy per reaction. 50 million times more energy. So if you take these numbers and you look at those, those 3,000 people that I was talking about, that the, the, the population growth during my talk, if they were average Norwegian families consisting of two adults and two children, and we were going to look at the amount of electricity they would use in one year. This would co correspond to 750 Norwegian average families. So if they were to get you know, that energy from fissioning uranium nuclei, they would need in total 790 grams, less than a kilo. But on the other hand, if they were to burn coal, they would have to burn 3,000 tons. And I don't think that we should forget that there's also waste, CO2 waste, for example, coming from burning hydrocarbons. So actually, uh, those 790 grams versus 3,000 tons is also, again, a picture of how strong that nuclear force is or how little the protons really want to stay together since the force forcing them together is tens of million times stronger than any other force that we know of in the universe. But we feel that nuclear power is very dangerous. And it must be, because we know of the accidents like Chernobyl and Fukushima. Well, when I first started to be interested in this field, field of science, I was, I was frightened and I was pretty sure that it was really, really risky because that, I mean, I knew that. But now as a scientist, I think that we should be rational about it and I like to look at the numbers. I like facts. So, we have a little morbid statistics here to look at how many people die per terawatt hour that we produce of electricity when we compare to different <coughs> sources. So the first one is coal. 161 people die per terawatt hour produced. And I don't think that's a big surprise, is it, that coal is bad? Then the next ones are oil and gas, both much better. Then you have the two renewables, wind and hydro, and now we're getting close to zero. And then, <laughs> you might have guessed, <laughs> nuclear. 0 0.04 deaths per terawatt hour electricity produced. I know it's morbid. I also know that this statistic is not telling us the entire truth, and I'm not saying that it is. But I think there are some very interesting numbers, and I think these, these numbers come as a surprise to many people when they first see them. Because you think at that the nuclear should well, at least be there next to coal, maybe even worse. 
And it's not. It's not that risk and dangerous. So, what is the problem then? Okay, now I'm getting in, into the real nuclear stuff. This is my field. Okay, so I think that even most pro nuclearists they will admit that the generation of this long-lived radioactive waste is a problem. It's, I will say, it's the major issue. But there are things to be done with this. And we can solve this problem. And now we, we have to go more in details. Okay, so what you see here, this is uh, what's called the chart of nuclides. And it's very sexy. And this is for a nuclear scientist. This is sort of like uh, the periodic table of elements. But instead of just looking at the elements, we need a total overview of our all known isotopes, you know, different versions of an element. So this is not, of course, you, you see this is not 3,000 boxes here, it's just a little piece of it. So for example here you see uranium, and there in the green you have uranium-235, and in red uranium-238. And those are the constituents of normal nuclear fuel. So when you put in this fuel, the, the, that is a mixture of uranium-235 and 238, what we want to happen, we want uranium-235 to be hit by neutrons and fission and producing energy, and that's nice. But that's not the only thing that goes on, unfortunately. Because you have that uranium-238 that I put a little red circle around. And the uranium-238 will not fission when it's hit by neutrons. It eats the neutrons. And when it eats the neutrons, it is transformed into plutonium. We don't like plutonium. It's not as nasty as you say, think, but I would say it's, it's rather nasty. And, and then again, the plutonium is also eating neutrons, and then the plutonium gets turned into this M, americium, and CM, curium, and then those are the main constituents of this long-lived radioactive waste that we don't, lo we don't, we don't like that. So, and, and, and this is sort of the sad thing, because the, the fuel that we put into the reactor, actually 95% of it is that uranium-238 that does not fission, does not produce energy, it's just there as an origin to waste. But, that's when we get to my favorite element, yes, I had a favorite element, that's normal, isn't it? In, in pink there, that's thorium. <laughs> Thorium. This element was uh, discovered in Norway, actually, in 1828, and it's named after our Norse god of thunder, Thor. So that's why it's thorium. And it, um, for me, as a Norwegian, it's especially interesting because Norway actually has one of the largest reserves in the world of thorium. Yes, we have oil and we have thorium also. Quite uh, not so fair, maybe. But uh, we, we may have the third largest reserve in the world of thorium. So that's kind of interesting. Okay, so, so I, I, I love thorium and I've been working with this forgotten element since I started my master's degree. And I said it's forgotten because it has never really had any commercial use besides in gas mantles. But recently, there has been more talk about thorium again. And the reason is that this is an element that may be used as a nuclear fuel. You see, when thorium is hit by neutrons, it also eats the neutrons like uranium-238 does. But instead of being transformed into plutonium, it will be transformed into... And now, oh, ha ha. It's being transformed into a third uranium isotope, a version of uranium, uranium-233. And uranium-233 is an excellent fissile material. So <laughs> thorium will not fission directly, but it will first be transformed into some uranium, and the uranium will fission. And as you can see from this chart of nuclides, you start up much further down. So you don't get all the way up to the plutonium and all those long-lived radioactive isotopes there. That's a very nice thing about thorium. No plutonium, none of that long-lived radioactive waste. Of course, that's, again, not the entire truth. It's part of it. But if you use thorium as a fuel, you will produce substantially less of radioactive waste. There will be some small parts if you treat the spent 
uh, thorium fuel in the, right, in the right way. And also another very nice thing about thorium is that since you turn it into something fissile, you can actually produce more fissile fuel than what you're consuming. So you put in some fuel and you get energy and at the end you have more fuel than you had when you started. That sounds too good to be true and very often then if it's good, sounds too good to be true, it's not true, but it is. It's not easy, it's difficult, but it is physically possible and this is called breeding. Also, thorium is more abundant than uranium. So actually the energy that is possible to get from the thorium is probably more than what you get from all the uranium and the fossil fuel combined. And if you manage to do this breeding that I was talking about, you will get more than 100 times more energy out of the fuel than what you do with how you use your fuel in nuclear reactors today. So thorium may definitely play a very important role in the energy mix of this century and further on. So is it right that a natural disaster should put an end to nuclear power, to the research into new fuels like thorium, new reactors that are safer, more economical, more proliferation resistant, that use it as fuel in a much better way? I think not. However, I'll be the first to admit that there are challenges with nuclear power Definitely, and there are challenges with thorium as a fuel. It's not just straightforward, it isn't. But the world is not black and white. And I think that we have to open our eyes and we have to communicate even though reality is not exactly how we want it to be. And we need facts. We can't just base our uh, decisions on feelings because we feel that it's such and such. We need the facts. And the a polarized debate, which is very typical, a polarized black and white debate is very typical for the nuclear industry. You're either 100% against and you won't listen to reason, or you're so for that you can't see any problems whatsoever. That's not constructive, of course. If you want to try to solve these big problems of getting enough energy to all these people, well, we have to open our eyes. And to end, the last thing I must say, I have a question, something I don't understand. How is it possible to worry about global warming and not be pro-nuclear? Thank you. <laughs>